So a nucleophile is a nucleus lover. So if you know your etymology, you know that file uh, means love or lover. So a bibliophile is someone who loves books, someone who is attracted to books. So a nucleophile is something that's going to be attracted to nuclei. And since a nucleus itself is positively charged from all of those protons, something that loves a nucleus, something that is attracted to that positive charge, must itself have a negative charge. So a nucleophile can have a full negative formal charge, or it could have a partial negative charge, or it could be just a region of high electron density, such as um, a lone pair of electrons or a pi bond or something like that. So nucleophiles have high electron density, and therefore they're attracted to things that are positively charged. An electrophile is an electron lover, so something that is attracted to electrons. And since electrons are negatively charged, something that's attracted to something that's negatively charged must itself be positively charged. So opposite charges attract. So electrophiles can have a full positive formal charge, or electrophiles could have a partially positive charge. And these are regions of low electron density. So electrons are going to flow from regions of high electron density, which of course is a nucleophile, to regions of low electron density, which are electrophiles. So opposite charges attract. And this is the idea of Coulomb's law in, in physics. Let's draw a couple of molecules here. Let's see if we can classify them as nucleophiles or electrophiles. So we'll start off with the ethoxide anion. So if I'm going to draw the ethoxide anion, it would look like this. So it is negatively charged like that. And if I'm thinking about, is this a nucleophile or an electrophile? Well, the ethoxide anion itself is negatively charged. So it is going to be attracted to something that is positively charged. So it's going to love nuclei. It's going to be a nucleophile. It's going to react as a nucleophile in an organic chemistry mechanism. So a very similar looking molecule, which is Ethanol. So let's go ahead and draw ethanol here. And let's think about the electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. So what's going to happen with these two electrons in the tug of war? Oxygen is more electronegative. So it's going to pull those electrons closer to it, giving it a partial negative charge. And since the, that electron density is leaving the hydrogen, the hydrogen ends up being partially positive. So I have now a molecule that has a partial negative charge on the oxygen. So the oxygen has a partial negative charge. That oxygen will love a nucleus. So that oxygen can act as a nucleophile in a mechanism and also has lone pairs of electrons, so regions of high electron density. So the oxygen portion of this molecule could also act as a nucleophile in a mechanism. So I have two different nucleophiles here. Which which nucleophile is a stronger nucleophile? Well, it makes sense that the strongest nucleophile is going to be the one that's most attracted to a positive charge. Therefore, it's going to be the one that is most negative. So since the first example has a full negative charge, so this has a full negative formal charge, and the second example only had a partial negative charge, the ethoxide anion is going to be a stronger nucleophile than ethanol because it has a full negative charge. So it's, it's just that simple. Let's draw a few more molecules here and let's see how we can classify those. So if I have if I have let's see two carbons and then a chlorine here and I'll put in some lone pairs of electrons on this chlorine. And if I focus in on this carbon right here, so this carbon that's bonded to the chlorine. Um, and I think about the differences in electronegativity. I know that chlorine being a halogen is much more electronegative than that carbon. So the two electrons that are in the bond between the carbon and the chlorine are going to be pulled closer to the chlorine, giving the chlorine a partially negative charge. And since those electrons are moving away from this carbon, it's going to end up with a partially positive charge. So that carbon is partially positive, and if something is 
po partially positively charged is going to be attracted to something that is negatively charged. So that carbon is going to be electrophilic. We can say that that carbon is going to act as an electrophile. So if we were reacting the ethoxide anion uh, with, with this molecule ethyl chloride down here, the ethyl chloride molecule having a partially positive carbon is going to act as an electrophile. It wants electrons. And the nucleophile has electrons that it can give to the electrophile. So if I think about a lone pair of electrons on my nucleophile, that oxygen is negatively charged, is attracted to things that are positively charged. So that oxygen is going to be attracted to this positively charged carbon. And this lone pair of electrons is going to attack this carbon. So attack is the proper organic chemistry terminology to be used here if we were drawing out a mechanism. So negative charges are attracted to positive charges. That's Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law is distance dependent. So the closer these two molecules are in solution, the, the, the more attracted our nucleophile is going to be to our electrophile. So the negative charge attacks the positive charge. And if, if you if you were doing a mechanism, actually, these electrons would have to come off onto the chlorine. But we're, we're not going to get too much into mechanisms yet. For right now, the goal is to identify nucleophiles, electrophiles, and understand how opposite charges attract. Let's draw another electrophile. So another electrophile could be something like, uh, let's see, so a carbon bonded to three other carbons, three, th three others uh, with, with CH3 groups, and zero hydrogens on this central carbon here. So if there are zero hydrogens on this central carbon, it's going to have a plus one formal charge to make what we call a carbocation, which we've talked about in earlier videos. So a carbocation being positively charged, it is attracted to electrons. So a carbocation functions as an electrophile, a region of low electron density. And we already said that ethanol, the oxygen portion of ethanol, can act as a nucleophile. Since it's partially negative, it has lone pairs of electrons. This lone pair of electrons can attack this carbon right here. So opposite charges attract. And this would form a new covalent bond between those two molecules. So once again, we've seen electrons flow from regions of high electron density from your nucleophile to regions of low electron density, which are electrophile. This is one of the most important skills to develop when you're writing your organic chemistry mechanisms. So this is extremely important to understand if you want to do well in an undergraduate organic chemistry course. And that brings me to the Schwartz rules. So the five things that you need to understand to succeed in undergraduate organic chemistry. Uh, Dr. Schwartz was my teacher for organic chemistry. He was a fantastic teacher. He taught me a lot. and. One day he explained to me the Schwartz rules. And organic chemistry is only five things, he said. So let's cover the five things that Dr. Schwartz considers to be the most important things to understand in organic chemistry. So first on the list, valence electrons. And hopefully you've seen how, how obvious it how important valence electrons are. Whenever we're drawing these mechanisms and molecules, we're just drawing our valence electrons. So the, the ability to draw dot structures and to figure out where the valence electrons go and what happens to the valence electrons with things like formal charge and oxidation states, extremely important. And the concept of electronegativity is also extremely important. So that is the second Schwartz rule. So electro negativity. So understanding electronegativity differences and how those affect molecules, how those affect reactions are ext is extremely important. Third, acid-base chemistry. So understanding Bronsted-Lowry acids, understanding Bronsted-Lowry bases, being able to follow protons and mechanisms uh, that is our third Schwartz rule. So we spend a lot of time on acid-base chemistry. And you'll really see how important this is when we start doing mechanisms. Fourth Schwartz rule, redox chemistry. So oxidation and reduction, assigning oxidation states, figuring out what's being oxidized, figuring out what's being reduced. And finally, the fifth Schwartz rule, what we just did in this video, the concept of uh, nucleophiles, so nucleophiles and electrophiles. So nucleophiles and electrophiles. And so these five things are the most important things to understand as an undergraduate if you would like to do well in organic chemistry. So may the Schwartz be with you.